Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. All right, spirit, ancient spirit of truth. That's what I want to get into today. Stape, welcome into the conversation. Hi there. Hello. Um, now, Stape, um, we just talked about your name, but what is the full? What What is your full name, and where uh, does it come from? My first name started with D. And when I was young, I'd sometimes signed my, signed my paintings, D. Stapleton Kearns. People would ask me what the D stood for, and I'd say deleted. <laughs> okay. I dropped my first name when I was about 19, maybe, I think. Hmm. Uh, and my grandfather done the same thing. My grandfather was Arthur Stapleton Kearns, and he dropped Arthur and became just Stapleton, well, Trigg. He was my mother's father. He became uh, Stapleton Trigg. So I follow his example pretty much a, uh, just somewhat after his death. So mm. it's a, uh, uh, there's a name for that. What is it? It's a necronym. Okay. That's a name you take upon someone's death as a necronym. You say um, the word necro sounds mm-hmm. like death, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. A necronym, a name taken to death. Uh, he was named after Stapleton Crutchfield, one of my relatives. Hmm. Uh, who was Stonewall Jackson's chief of artillery. What? That's cool, man. See, Why would I, I lie? Like. What would I gain? Huh? Why would I lie? What would I gain? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> that's, just, that, that's just very, very cool. That's a cool story. I've never heard anyone's name uh, named Stapleton before, except for Chris Stapleton, the incredible singer. Uh, but that's his last name. But, that's right. Uh, um, you know... Yeah. Uh, it was a common enough name in the Deep South in 1900. It wasn't a bizarre name, and everybody would have known why you had that name once. Crutchfield was a war hero. Mm. Uh, I took it just because I hated my first name. Hmm. And, Will you tell uh, us what your first name was? No. Delor- <laughs> was, it D- was it Dolores? Was it Dolores? Is that what it was? But yeah, Stapleton, that's a cool name, especially as an artist, right? It kind of stuts you out, but state. It's a green tradition, you know, that uh, Child Hassam was really Fred. He was Frederick Child Hassam. Oh, okay, yeah. So then you get rid of the Fred, and you just have the uh, middle name. Well, that's, you know, my, my, my middle name is Victor, and so I go by Victor. And um, So it's very interesting. I, I, I always encourage people to, you know, own your own name. Change it if you want, you know, because somebody gave it to you. I did so long ago that I, I know maybe one or two people who knew me as a child. Mm. Uh, whatever. That's enough about the name. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> uh, very, very cool. It's interesting for about two minutes, and then let's talk about art. Very cool. So what are you working on right now? Uh, I just, well, as you know, we're all kind of locked down right now. But up until about two weeks ago, I was up painting in Vermont. I go mm. to Jeffersonville, Vermont. I organize a thing called the Jeffersonville Winter Rendezvous. Mm. And about 40 or 50 of us, really from all over the world, but certainly from all over the country. We had, uh, we had Russians and people coming in from Italy. About 40, 45 of us meet every year and paint together for a couple of weeks in Jeffersonville, Vermont, uh, which is way up. It's uh, due east of Burlington. And it's, I just have been going there since 1900, 1910, somewhere in there. All of my New England painting heroes, like Aldo Hibbard, Lester Stevens, worked up in Jeffersonville, Vermont. John Carlson wrote the book. 
uh, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting was part of that group. There's a whole group of artists who went up there. And then through the 80s and 90s, uh, I went up there tagging along with a bunch of old guys. And uh, one of the people I painted with up there all the time is a guy named T.M. Nicholas. And T.M. and I have been going up there together for, well, I don't know, 30, maybe 40 years, 30 years anyway. And it used to be we were going up with these huge gangs of guys, and they all died. Mm. One day we were standing out in this field, and we realized there's nobody else here. It's just us. And so I organized this th thing called the Jeffersonville Winter Rendezvous to see if we could uh, get that fired up again. This was our fourth year this year. Oh, wow. Uh, but I'm and up about how many guys do you – and is it just men that go up together? or, or is... No, no, it's men, and, it's men and women. Nice. No, it's co -ed. And there's no vetting. People that know about it go. We don't, you know, to say anybody that you can come or can't come. And there's no name tags. And there's no zombie donors with loosely fitted dentures who have to be met with when the light is just getting good late in the day. Simply a rendezvous. Nice. So I spent a lot of my winter up in Vermont painting. Mm. I paint a lot of snow and I worked out, work outside a lot. Now, last winter I started a picture one morning with a couple of buddies of mine, Eric Tobin and TM and I, and it was 26 below. Whoa. That's insane, man. <laughs> you just made my, my Caribbean blood, like, shrill. Uh, well, I grew up in Minnesota. Okay, very cool. Guys Did, are, you know, what is it about the cold, painting in the cold, that, that, that attracts you? Well, I love painting snow. I like the big sort of, you know, the way all the snow is real high key and it hauls everything, hmm. everything together. Now there's somebody coming in the door. You'll have to come in, but you must sit very quietly. I'm doing a pod. All right. Ready to roll with you? Sorry. Yeah. I, I unpaused it. <laughs> um, so what, yeah, you were, you were saying. Um, when is, when is my snow favorite is paint? There are more different colors outside, at least colors with different names on them. Mm -hmm. There are in the summer. In the summer, everything's, you know, blue like the sky or yellow like, like grass or blue and yellow together like green. Everything mm -hmm. is green and blue outside. Not everything, but most things. And outside in the winter, you've got all the mauves and the browns and the sand colors. And mm -hmm. it's, it's the color of $500 suits. And I like oh, that. Oh, shoot. That's cool, man. I like, yeah. I like the way you think. Um, it's really beautiful. I, I, when I moved to Erie, I was terrified that I would get into these, you know, into this horrible winter. And uh, the winter before, uh, they got, I think it was six feet of snow on Christmas Eve, right? And, um, and so I was like very, very nervous. But I went with the attitude that I was going to meet the winter and find her beauty in it. Um, because, you know, there are artists like yourself who, who, who love painting the snow. And I was like, okay, I, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta find what it is that you guys see in this, in this thing. And, and there were glimpses when it did fall. Um, I you actually know had more of Aldro T. Hibbard. What was that? Do you know who Aldro T. Hibbard? Was? No, I do not. Aldro first name, A L D R O middle initial T. Last name Hibbard, H I B B A R D. He and Emil Gruppe, E M I L, second name G R U P P E, are my heroes. And they did mm. a lot of winter painting. Wow, beautiful. Who, the guys who would have been our grandparents' generation? My grandparents' generation. Yeah, probably my great grandparents' generation. And uh, that's the guys who were born in the. 18, late 1880s, 1890s, in there. Yeah, now the, the the fellow that you studied under, he was part of that age group, right? Yes, the guy uh, studied with, well, I blew through a couple of art schools. Uh, I left high school early in order to more fully participate in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And then uh, went to a couple of art schools. They were kind of a joke. First day of art school we filled the classroom with inflated garbage bags i had wanted to be john constable and we were filling garbage bags uh you could have a lot of fun in art school in 1970 i'm here to testify to that uh but after a year of that i got out went to the university for a year and ended up 
uh, studying with a man in Boston, uh, R.H. Ives Gamel, Robert Hale Ives Gamel. Hmm. And he was born in the late 1880s. Uh, and he uh, was a relic. He was 80-something when I got to him in the early 70s. Wow. And he'd been a student. Of, I don't know if you the Boston School was, but he'd been a student of people like William Paxton, Edmund Tarbell. Uh, and uh, he'd actually met John, a singer sergeant. Wow. Uh, what in the First World War? Uh, very interesting guy. Wow. Very severe. Very legendarily severe. Uh, and he ran a, a program in his studio where he had four or five young men. You remember you asked me before, there were women included. There were not in Ives studio. He would only teach men. Hmm. Uh, it was different times. Yeah. And he was a different generation, but there were always four or five guys in his studio. Most of us 20 to 25, 26 studying with him. And that went on for about 50 years. He had about 50, 60 students. Wow. Many of them are dead now because I knew guys that were, students of Gamble that were 30, 40 years my senior, who have now died of old age. A lot of them. Uh, he died in 1980. Wow. Wow. I've been paying full time since the early 1970s. Yeah, I saw that. I'm like, my goodness, you've been painting like professionally almost as long as I've been alive. <laughs> I sold my first picture at an outdoor art festival in Rochester, Minnesota in about 1968. Actually, what? it wasn't a picture. It was what was called a batik, a wax resist process on cloth. Yes, yes, yes. I would draw it. I'd take a piece of cloth and I'd put it on an embroidery hoop, draw on it with uh, India ink and then color it up with batik. Then my first piece that I sold, it was a wizard under a toadstool. <laughs> and I had, had it, uh, it was a flat piece of cloth, perhaps. I don't know. Well, I must have been about uh, 18 by 20 or somewhere in there that I had scotch taped to a piece of cardboard that came with my father's shirts mm -hmm. back in the dry cleaner. And then I stretched saran wrap over them and scotch taped them on the back. And I sold a whole parcel of them that day at an outdoor art festival. I went home with, I can't remember now, $350, 400 That was a lot of money. Wow. In 1960. A working man working in a factory for 100 bucks a week in those days. Wow. I mean, you know, like a month's wages for a working man uh, in an afternoon or in a day. So what did that do for you? Like, what did that tell you? What did that ignite in your soul? Just to, in terms of the business, well, you know, being the business of art. It was years before anything like that happened again. I didn't expect that for sure. Uh, but I decided really early on I wanted to do this for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to, one... I came out of the hippie background, you know. The last thing I wanted to do was punch a clock for Mr. Charlie. I knew I was going to be self-employed. That was just essential. I was going to be self-employed no matter what happened. Uh, and uh, I, uh, when I was studying with R.H. Ives Gamble, uh, and now we're talking a little bit later, I got to Ives in the middle 70s, uh, maybe 73 or 4, I can't figure out, 74 maybe, I don't know. But uh, in the summer, he handed me off to one of his lieutenants a guy I remember, Robert Douglas Hunter, who was a professional painter. And so really early on, I was 22 maybe, I suppose, 21. I was tagging along and being mentored by a guy who was really a professional painter, made his living painting pictures. So that was a big influence on me. It was really important to be a pro. From Jump Street, my plan is to be a pro. Because if I want to make these things, I've got to get paid for them so I can make more. But I am not in the business of making and selling pictures. I am in the business of building an artist. You're, you're not in the business of making and selling paintings. I love no, that. I'm in the business of building an artist. You're building an artist. Now, when you say building an artist, I'm assuming you're talking about yourself, but you're talking about it in a way that it's separate from yourself. Yeah. I'm not in the business of making and selling pictures. I'm in the business of building an artist. Ex uh, expound. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> The, the point is to make an artist of myself. The pictures are a byproduct. No, no, I got that. I just, I, 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 I love the philosophy of it, right? Thousands and thousands of paintings. I've sold at least a couple thousand. Uh, I've made, been making paintings all my life. And it's always just another painting. I make a painting, and it's always another painting. Uh, but the point is to be able to do it. I'm out to build my skills, mm. to build my abilities, to build my taste. Uh, it, it's about... Uh, uh, I don't want to say self-improvement, but 
it's not about any I individual. Gotcha. It's about building building an artist. That's so it's really not even about a business. It's it's just about being able to afford yourself the space yeah. to develop yourself. Yeah, and because I can sell things to get more. Yeah, and if I had to work work a job part time, I wouldn't have been able to do what I've done. Yeah, I did fifteen years of no car, no phone, and no bank account. I did fifteen years of real, real hard living, getting here. Hmm. I mean, real, real hard living. Fixing my shoes with duct tape. Um, I had a trail of people I knew who would feed me. I lived real hard for fifteen years. I feel you, man. <laughs> but that's the story of anyone who's going to be self-made, right? Wow, that's that's very very cool. Um, w- w- but also, mm-hmm. I did years of extreme success. I put two children through private school, painting Beautiful. pictures. So I've had all the extremes. And, and, and what was one of the when you look back at those two contrasts? what was something that was similar in you and both? And then what was something similar? I mean, uh, very, very different in both in terms of the way you thought about, you know, either your life, your art, yourself, you know, money, whatever it was. The only, I, you know, it's always been, I've always been after the same thing. I've been trying to make the same kind of picture since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I do it better. Than you. Uh, but uh, I guess, Everything changed in about 1983. Uh, I moved to Rockport, Massachusetts, which was an old historic art colony. And it was full of artist-run galleries, and I opened a little art gallery there. And off and on for about 20 years, I, I ran my own art gallery. And all of a sudden, I was making a lot of money and uh, selling a lot of art. And uh, that, that was a real big change. I went from starving to do it. And, and kind of, I was always confident off in myself, but it was really nice to have that reflected back at me by the world. People looked at me as being the real thing. It was yeah. really important in my, in my definition. Uh, and at a certain point, I, you know, I, I had proved, I, I mean, I proved what I wanted to do. Hmm. Uh, so that was the big change. And that happened not right away. It took me a couple of years in, by about 1985, because I started art school in 1970. Hmm. By about 85, I'd reached a point where, uh, you know, I can remember, maybe it was 83 or 4, the first year. It was real starvation year. But I can remember uh, I, I had my shoes fixed with duct tape, and they were an old pair of, of, of uh, sneakers that were all made out of plastic somewhere. And, and they smelled horribly. <laughs> and I, I fixed them with duct tape. I used to leave them out, outside my – I had a little deck in the place I lived in. I'd leave them on the deck at night so I didn't have to smell them. They, mm. they, they didn't breathe. They were plastic, you know. Yeah. I remember walking up the street to a, a little uh, clothing store up the street that sold shoes and buying myself a nice pair of leather shoes, a pair of uh, decent shoes. I was so proud of myself. I'd earned these shoes. Wow. In fact, I was sent a letter. I went to a, a boarding private school when I was a kid. Uh, I, and they, they have a, a glossy uh, magazine they send out quarterly to their alumni. And they sent me a little card to fill in uh, what I'd done recently, and I sent them a picture of myself at my easel, <clears throat> and and there's a caption I wrote: "I have new shoes," and they published it too. That's awesome, man! I love that. It, uh, it's weird how those little things matter so much. Yeah, isn't it? a big deal to me. Uh, a lot of things were big deals along the way. I remember being able to to uh, to uh, paint on linen. Mm. When I was young, I painted on cotton. I reached a point where I could afford to buy linen and oil primed linen. I was painting on decent, decent canvas. I remember being at when I, I realized that it was not only time, but I had to use gold frames. I used nothing but 23 karat frames. All my frames are real gold. They're not the shop kind that you buy from your local art supply stores. They're uh, museum quality frames. They're all handmade. Mm. I remember hitting a point where I could do, you know, uh, museum quality frames in my art. That was a big deal to me. I liked that. Wow. And, and do you still have the uh, art gallery going? No. I closed the art gallery about you know, 15, 20 years ago. Oh, I, wow. I moved out of Rockport, Massachusetts. I now live in Derry, New Hampshire, which is really an outer suburb of Boston. When I say I live in New Hampshire. People think I live up in the White Mountains, but 
I'm in an exurb of Boston. Boston sprawls across the, the border up into New Hampshire, really. Mm-hmm. There's no cows or chickens between me and Copley Square. I can be in downtown Boston in 45 minutes if there's no traffic. Nice, nice. And I have a lifetime involvement with the Guild of Boston Artists. It's a small organization, artist organization, existing since 1914. I'm on the board of governors. But when mm-hmm. I was a kid, I worked there as an intern uh, for free when I was 20. So I, you know, it was on my bucket list to be a member. There's only 45 members. Wow. Uh, so it was on my lifetime bucket list to be a member of the guild, and now I am. That's and that's when, a when did you become? When did you become a member? 15, 20 years ago. Nice. That's cool, man. And then, so they only accept 35? We have 45 members. 40, wow. Uh, the number isn't exactly pinned down. It's a strange institution. It was started by American Impressionist painters, guys like William Paxton, Tarbell. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they set a weird rule for an art association, but it's smart. They, they can't take more. If you are a member, you always have a painting hanging there. Okay. That means they can't take more members than they can hang. Oh, it's about interesting. Wall space. wall space for 60 members because a lot of people, not a lot of people, but there's 10 or 15 members oftentimes who are uh, elderly or they're emeritus and they don't get work there for one reason or another. But actually right now, I think there's around between 45 and 50 members somewhere in there right now. It never gets a whole lot larger than that. That's nice. Very, very cool. And so that was another goal of yours, and you achieved that. And uh, it seemed like you're a goal-setting kind of guy. Well, there are goals that will never be met. Mm-hmm. When I was young, I always imagined that I would show at the uh, National Academy of Design. Mm-hmm. And that is not going to happen. Uh, they still exist, but they're not prominent like they once were. And they used to have a biennial that anybody could, anybody could get past the jury could show in. And I got into that show several times. I was working on being a member, but it never happened. Now, you never even hear about the National Academy. It's kind of disappeared. I think maybe a big deal for architects, but not for painters. And I always wanted to show at Grand Central Galleries. That was when I was a kid. If you were a representational painter or a traditional painter, that's where you wanted to be. Uh, it's in New York on Madison Avenue, and it's, uh, it's gone now. So some of the things I wanted to do, I didn't get to do. But I did manage to be in the Guild. That was big for me. Uh, New England uh, has a long tradition of painters and painting, as does Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. So you're in Pennsylvania, you know, you've got a hallowed ground there too with Redfield, all those guys from the New Hope area. Yep, yep. And in, 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 Pencil, in Philadelphia, you know, Anschutz, and Aikens, and all those people. Yep. And you got the Brandy Wine area and all that other stuff too. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I'll Same. bet you've got another question for me. Oh. Oh, I do, I do. Um, I was looking over some of your work, and one of the things um, I really, really enjoyed about it was your palette. You know, as I was looking at it, it just had this very, very, I want to say an earthy feel to it. Um, And it, how do I say this in words? Um, There was this ancient oldness to, to it. And um, and that does that's not a negative thing when it comes out of me. That's it oh, just no, means totally it's totally rooted. Old-timey. I'm very I'm very old timey in what I do. Part of it's a New England. There's a there's a New England thing having to do with with that. Um, yeah, I am an example of a kind of New England paint, painter. Although I grew up in Minnesota, I mm. came to it as a foreigner when I was nineteen or twenty or so. But uh, I've worked hard at being a New England type of painter. My heroes are New England painters from a generation or two before me. So I've worked hard to be a New England style painter. Hmm. Uh, what's on my palette? Is that, are you asking that? I can tell you if you want to know. If you want to go there. Um, I was actually really getting into what you were just saying there. Um, it, you know, just, I, I would love to explore more of that spirit of that you know, New Englandness um, in your work um, or that you're tapping into. There, there was a, a book by Kenyon Cox, and he talked about this classic spirit. Classic you know. point of view. Yes, yes. I've read it repeatedly. It's, um, it, you know, and so I, I often refer back to it because it's, 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 it's like this beautiful bridge between the old and the new. And um, 
and when I was looking at your work, I was just feeling that. And then when I was looking at uh, your teacher's work and then Paxson's work, you know, like seeing, though they were doing very different subjects, you're doing a lot more landscapes than they were doing. Um, but it just I has that. I would be very surprised to see what I'm doing now. He was oh, trying right. to raise up uh, allegorical painters and Boston schools style painters, and he succeeded. I can name several of his students who exactly what he is, was intending to produce. I'm sort of a uh, uh, a surprise. I, mm. I ended up ending up in Ro I ended up in Rockport, and that has its own style of painting. So mm -hmm. I'm an exponent of the Rockport school. So I'm sort of a hybrid. Although many of the other Gamel students would probably say it was more of an apostate. <laughs> <laughs> what are what are two or three things that you pull um, that you draw from that experience? Um, you know, from your teacher. Uh, from our Gamble, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, I always put out what had been his education uh, around the time of the First World War, uh, and he he was also in 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 Paris and in those uh, uh, programs studying over there. Mm -hmm. um, but he was uh, he was trying to preserve what he'd been the way he'd been trained uh, right after the First World War. So basically, I got an education that was way out of time. And it, nowadays, it's been reproduced a lot. A lot of people have what they call atelier training. Mm -hmm. so it was the original version of that in America, in a way. When I went to him, he was the only, only person in the country doing it. Uh, and many, many of the programs that are ateliers about the world today are, are linked back to Ives in one way or another. Uh, mm -hmm. The guys that run the two acal uh, ateliers in Florence, Graves and Cecil, Mm -hmm. are both Gamble students. Well, Cecil is a Gamble student, and Graves is a student of Richard Lack, who was a Gamble student. There's a tradition there. Yeah. That's awesome, man. <laughs> That's really, really cool. I'm glad uh, we pushed a little bit and that came out. Um, from, from, from when you were with uh, Gamble, what would you say is something that, um, that you were learning back in, the, in, in that time that artists may not be picking up on today, even if they are in an atelier kind of setting. Could you please repeat that? I'm afraid I missed that. Okay. What is something that, um, or maybe there isn't, but I'm just kind of curious if there's something that when you were going through that training with him, that when you look at ateliers today um, or art schools, that they're, they're missing it. They're, they're doing a lot of other things, but there, there's something that they're not, connecting with with the work from back then you know people go to art school so they won't have to be artists okay don't understand that one okay but uh, they go to art school so they can get a certificate okay yes a receipt rather than having to live by the fruit of their art mm. people generally go to ateliers learning to learn to paint uh I'm sure there are exceptions, and I'll probably anger your listeners by saying that, but that's been my experience. Uh, the atelier training is, uh, if I had a child who wanted to be an artist, I'd send them to an atelier. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a number of them around, but uh, it's pretty serious training. It's not like art school. It's very, very, very rigorous training. I spent uh, months copying drawings. I spent months, if close to a year, uh, well, I don't know, in nine months, drawing from uh, the cast, lightened plaster bus. We mm -hmm. would figure four hours a day every morning. Uh, I didn't become a landscape painter until after that period. It was mostly, it was figurative training. And we were required to really know our art history. We had to know our art history at a level that, uh, uh, particularly American art history. Mm. That was very important. Uh, drew a lot of portraits. Uh, you know, a lot of pencil drawing, a lot of charcoal drawing. Uh, very, you know, tight academic training, which is a great background, but it's not what I do anymore today. And, and how, like, from, how, how does your approach shift from today than, than it did back then? Uh, uh, well, for one thing, I'm no longer a studio painter. I do have a studio and work on paintings here, but most of, everything I do is at least started outside. Hmm. Most of it's finished in the studio. When I'm in the studio, I pretty much work out of my head. I do have references, but I seldom look at them because I've pushed things around so much and changed things so much that uh, people always imagine I'm working from memory, and I say, no, I, I'm working uh, 
from imagination. I love that. That's beautiful. Because those are two very different things, right? Very. Yeah. When I work outside, I'm looking at nature and I'm essentially recording information. This goes here, that goes there. I come in the studio and if I were to have a photo of this studio, which some of us do, now, when I look at a photograph, I say, oh, the same thing. This goes here, that goes there. Let's say, here's this, is that, and this is over here. But if I work out of my head, I look at the painting, I'm asking myself, what's this painting need? Yep. It was a um, reading somewhere where they were talking about the word designo. I think it's how oh. you pronounce it. I'm probably <laughs> pronouncing it wrong. But. I, I might just say design, but that's a big thing with me. Design is very, very important to me. The longer I paint, the more it's about design. And that's typical of Rockport stuff, too, the old Rockport mm. idea about design. You know, there are cameras that are made that you can strap to a tree in the woods, and when an animal walks by, it snaps its picture. Mm -hmm. Those pictures made by that robotic camera have composition. You can crop anything in front of you and have a composition. A design is something different than that. You cannot crop to a design. Design is something, it's a process of the human mind. It's a deliberate ordering. It's arrangement made of the shapes and lines in front of you deliberately. It implies human decision-making. If you're making no decisions, you may have a composition, but you won't have a design. I, I absolutely agree with you one billion percent. <laughs> It's it's it, it, when people call in to complain. Uh, well, no, well, if they're listening to this, they won't. And if they are, shh, you're not allowed to. Um, no, I think that difference between memory and imagination. Imagination is where the designing happens, is where the invention of the of the artwork occurs. And um, and I think it was Da Vinci who was talking about that. That um. You know, there's drawing, which is kind of rendering what you're looking at, but then there's design, which is the inventing, you know, that thinking process that you go through. Um, that, Evidently, that, the Italians, and I don't speak Italian, um, mm -hmm. use the word design differently than we do. And when they say design, they include both drawing and what we'd call, what mo the most people call composition. Yeah. Their word is broader. Uh, but I don't speak Italian, but I'm very, I'm very careful thinking about the difference between a, a composition and drawing. I have known people who simply cut square holes out of nature before them as accurately as they can. And though they eschew the use of a camera, they have made of themselves meat cameras. Mm. Meat cameras. If you hear that little scratching, that's me taking a note. That's awesome. Meet cameras. A blog. I, I, uh, uh, this wife I used to have mm -hmm. used to get all upset with me because I was always complaining when I had the gallery. People walked in, they'd say they're artists, and they, and they didn't know anything. And it used to drive me wild. And finally, at one point, she said, "Look, if you're going to complain about it all the time, why don't you just tell them what they need to know?" There's a thing called a blog. It was a new idea at that point. Why don't you write a blog? <laughs> And so I wrote a blog. I, I was going to, I started it as a New Year's Eve project. You know, I was going to write every day for a year, but it turned into 1,030 posts in a row. It's at Stapleton Kearns at blogspot.com. And printed out, it runs about 1,200 pages. So it's 300 pages longer than Moby Dick. Wow. Uh, and I had an enormous amount of people reading it. It was crazy. I had more people reading it than read most, most of contemporary art magazines. It was huge. And I did for uh, 1,030 days and then realized I've, I've had enough. I said what I wanted to say. Uh, but I, wrote, I attempted to write down everything I knew about painting, everything I learned along the way, and everything I thought would be useful to know if you wanted to be an artist. That's awesome, man. And it's uh, all still, still there. I guess things on the Internet live forever. If you're interested in... Uh, uh, what I, what's there, you can go see it. I tried to give away everything I've learned. Hmm. Uh, all stories about people I've known, and I read about design, a lot about design. I read about color and pigments and painting and being professional and staging shows, anything you can think of about art I've written about. It goes on and on forever. 
It's huge. Take you months to read the whole thing. Love it. Love it. Um, and then what we can do is uh, take that blog post, um, that blog spot, uh, your blog, and link it in the um, the, uh, and if in somebody the wants to, description. If somebody wants to read it, I'd read it backwards. That is, I'd start at the beginning. Oh, that's interesting. It's cumulative in a way. And if you just click on the blog, you'll get the last thing that I wrote, which is actually an announcement for a workshop, I think. Mm. But if you go back to the start, it's cumulative. I start with, you know, how to stretch a canvas and what the different colors do. And it grows ever and ever, ever more complex, you know. That's Have you ever thought about putting it in a book? Yes. In fact, I'm supposed to be writing a book and I haven't finished mm. it. I do write. Well, you have a book. You have like 12,000 pages, <laughs> 1,200 pages. Uh, no, I thought that, well, that's when I decided I'd do a book. I had a publisher approach me about doing a book. I thought all I have to do is cut and paste out of the blog, but it didn't work out to be that simple, and that's thrown me for a loop. But the book will happen. But mm -hmm. I, I write other things. I wrote uh, uh, not the last issue, but the issue before the American Art Review magazine. I wrote an uh, article for them. I wrote the catalog for a show of an artist who I knew who's now dead. I remember Charles Movali. Hmm. Uh, I wrote a catalog for a show, and then the American Art Review published that. So I, I write various things. How does your writing affect your artwork? You know, if it I does. Don't know. I, don't th I think they're two separate things, other than I wouldn't dare write about anything else other than art because I don't really know much about anything else. Mm -hmm. I would never, for instance, try and write, you know, about uh, history or, well, except for art history. About the only thing I know enough about to write authoritatively on is art. So it's the other way around. My my art's affected my writing because it's the only thing I can write about. Oh, nice, I nice. Nothing else to write about it. So you talked about art history a couple times now. Um, you know, if you bought a said, new guitar, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you said you bought a new guitar and you came to me and said, "Stapleton, I want to be a rock and roll player." I looked at you and said, "Great, man. What do you think about?" Uh, what do you think about Keith Richards? And you gave me sort of a blank stare and said, Keith, who? <laughs> I'd realized that you weren't going to be a, a fine electric guitar player. Yeah. This wasn't going to happen. You weren't going to be a rock and roller. When Much less than you know, Chuck Berry or Steve Vai or Hendrix. Uh, you got to know, you, you know what other people have done. How are you going to know what great stuff is like to make it yourself if you haven't seen it done by others? Yeah. It's it's funny. Um, when I was seventeen, the uh, I guess the atelier, the studios that I went to study in. Um, when I called my drawing master up for the first time, uh, his name is Myron Barnstone, and uh, he says, "So, what is it that you want to do with your with with art?" I said, "Well, you know, I want to I want to do figure drawing, right?" Oh. Well, who do you know that does figure drawing? What have you read on figure drawing? And he, he just starts drilling me. And I'm like, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, but what I really mean is I, I want to do comic books, right? And uh, he says, well, who do you know on comic books? And what do you read on comic books? And, and he starts drilling me. And I'm like, ah. Uh. And he's like, that's what I thought. Typical teenager, only interested in nipples and pubic hair. And, <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that he and I would agree on that, on the, uh, on the importance. You, you have to know your art history. I, I can never stress that enough. I teach workshops. I just pound on people. you got to know your art history. And yeah. that's where Americans, you need to know your American art history. When I had a gallery, when everybody used to walk into my gallery and claim any sort of expertise on painting, they said they're an artist and said they're an art teacher. I would always ask them, can you name me five American painters who died before 1930? You know what the most common answer I received was? Sergeant. Mon uh, who? The most common answer I received was Monet. Really? Mm hmm I've asked, and I was asking that question of people who supposedly were art educators. You just have to know your art history, particularly have to know your American art history. How are you going to, I mean, if you, you corner all the classical musicians, they know Rachmaninoff and Chopin and Bach. They know their, their music history. You corner all the rock and rollers, they know their history of rock and roll. They, they don't, you know. Yeah. But people in painting have got often, or in the arts have been led to believe that 
that you can figure it all out yourself. You're going to be a chemist. You know, you don't just go around your basement and start throwing chemicals together and figure, you figure it out. Other people figured out the periodic table of elements, for instance, and you learn that. You don't invent your own. It's basics. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that's really important. It was, when the college I went to, they gave you a minor in art history. And we took so many art history classes there. And I love them all. Um, actually, it's funny. The, my favorite class I took in college was American art history. And um, years later, I went, uh, I think I got a t teaching job somewhere and they needed my transcript. And so I went down and, you know, and they sent it to me and I looked at it. And the only F that I got in all of uh, college was this American art history. I have no idea. I think I got it because I missed four days and automatically you failed a class or something. But for 20 years, I told people, my God, the best class I ever had was this American art class, uh, art history class. It was incredible. And I talked about it so highly for 20 years. And then I, 20 years later, I found out I failed. And uh, <laughs> I've got a similar sort of a story I can tell. Uh, about a month ago, I gutted the attic of my house. I, I, one of my, my hobby is working on my house. Uh, I gutted the attic. I got this big old 1897 house I've been working on for years and years and years. It's an endless project. And I do most of it myself. But actually, I gutted the attic, and I hired a couple of guys to help me with that. We built a chute down to a dumpster in the front yard. Nice. It was a big, we threw away dumpster loads of. We threw out all the walls and ceilings, and some bats. Mm. Uh, we bats. threw bats out. We evicted the bats. You can't kill them, you know. You got to evict them. Uh, we cleared up this attic. And it took two dumpster loads, but mm. one of the things I ran into is a, a a big box of photographs. It was sort of a history of my art back when things were on film. Before we were digital, and mm -hmm. it was a couple of shoe boxes of photographs of every painting I made for a 20-year period, 30-year mm -hmm. period, before we went to went from film to digital. Yeah. And I started looking at this stuff, and they were I date all my pictures so I could see by looking at the images what year it was made, and they were roughly in chronological order anyway. And I realized that I, I went to art school, started art school in '70, and mm -hmm. '72 or three I got to gamble, and then in '83 I opened my own gallery. And it wasn't until about 1990 that I was making decent paintings. I spent 20 years making junk. All the paintings I made for a 20-year period hmm. are, are an embarrassment to me. And for the, the last eight or nine years or eight years of that, that, I was a working pro selling pretty much everything I did. I was living by my art, working my tail off. Uh, and I wasn't getting a lot of money but I sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of paintings during that era, but they weren't any good. I didn't really get my act together until I've been painting full-time 20 years. Hmm. And the last, almost the last half of it, I was painting for a living. You know, I was paying for a living, I guess, because I paid for a starving. But <laughs> um, even as a pro with my own art gallery, the first eight years even after of that, I was just making junk. So it took me fully full-time 20 years to get my act together as a painter. When you look back at all of that, what was it? Or, of course, it's never one thing, but what was one or two or three things that kind of came together that began to, to work for you? And you were like, from your perspective, yes, I'm making art now. Well, I had real good training at the hand eyes gym. I had mm -hmm. real, real good basic training. Uh, I, I learned to draw passably well. I knew my way around the different pigments and what they do. So I had a good background when I, you know, but that's, I meet these people coming to the ateliers and, and they think they're made men. They're 25 years old and they can draw still life. And there's such a jump between there to, yeah. to being an artist, but it's the first step. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize when I opened my first guy how much I had to learn. Found out in a big hurry. Mm -hmm. uh, the big things that, that helped me were I, I knew a lot of people that were older professional artists who showed me and told me how to do things. Uh, and I had a love for painting. It's perpetually interesting to me. I don't really get bored or frustrated by it. I'll work a project just on and on and on, scrape it down, do it again, scrape it down, do it again if need be. Hmm. Uh, I uh, will not basically will not surrender a painting. I've worked bang, I banged away at the same painting semester for, for weeks, maybe a month or longer, just trying to get so I'm, some silly 24 by 36 to work, you know? Uh, and I've had the benefit of having a lot of people have helped me, you know? 
Mm. Uh, known a lot of good painters who've taken the time to show me how to do things or talk to me. Awful lot of things weren't really anybody showing me anything other than just being around somebody and watching them do good things, you know, mm -hmm. going by windows of uh, Thomas Nicholas or uh, Strissix and looking at old paintings. Looked at a lot of old paintings, been around a lot of old paintings. Uh, seen a lot of them. I collect myself. So I, I've, I've looked at a lot of paintings. Millions, I suppose. Thousands. I've spent a lot of time in museums. Uh, did, I, did I get off the question? What's the next question? <laughs> um, it's interesting. You know, this. Uh, when you're looking back at those, I'm kind of curious because when I'm dealing with, a, let's say, a new student who's older, right, and they say, well, you know, I've always been wanted to do the arts, but, you know, I ended up raising a family and had a job, and, and now they're at this place in their life where they're trying to come back to it, right? And one of the things I always encourage them to, to, to take on this perspective is that, yeah, you may have not been painting and drawing like, you know, professional for the last 20, 30 years or whatever. But what you do have is you have a message and you have a story and you have a life that you lived, right? You have that part of it. And now you can take the next few years and really hone your craft on how you communicate it, you know, through through the arts. And I and and I'm wondering, and I wanted to ask you, is that part of what made the difference between your early work and your older work um, is that you just had you lived life. Yeah, I don't necessarily think that, no. Okay. It might, it might, I'm doing a, a highly technical kind of art. And if you were doing some of the kind of art, I don't know what the deal is. But for the kind of thing I do, uh, there was just an awful lot to learn, an awful lot of mistakes to be made. I had to make them over and over and over again. Gotcha. I really want to make them. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I get a lot of that. I teach workshops, and, I, and I, I suppose I'm a little cruel, but I think it's better to tell people what I think. What I perceive to be the truth is that you're not going to retire at 55 or 60 years old and get out there and compete with somebody who's been doing it since they're 18, and they're 50 now. Somebody's got 30 or 40 years of hard work in. You aren't going to catch up with them in a couple of years or even 10 or 15 years. Uh, if you're really going to be good at this, it's like, you know, you wouldn't retire and imagine you're going to play violin with the uh, Boston Symphony Orchestra. I'm going to take up the violin when I retire and I'm going to play with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. It's not going to happen. If you're really going to be at the top levels, top echelons, you got to start young and do it full time. Sorry, it's an uncomfortable truth, but there you have it. That being said, I've known some people who've gotten pretty good that did work at it their whole lives. Uh, I know a guy who's a cardiologist out of uh, Indiana who pushed his practice back to a couple days a week and paints about four days mm -hmm. a week. And over the last few years, he's gotten very good. But I expect he's been working four days a week for probably 10 or 15 years now. Mm -hmm. It just takes a lot of work to get good. <clears throat> same with the animal, same with the violin, you know? Yep. Uh, and people don't like hearing that. I know the most unpopular blog post I ever wrote was when I was saying that. People... Just they don't want to hear it, but there you have it. But what you can have is, you know, you know somebody who's a good piano player. They're never going to be on stage at Carnegie Hall, but they can play in their home. They can own their neighborhood. They can play at the local club. They can be their county's piano player and be revered and, and have excitement playing music, and people will gather around the piano at Christmas and sing as they play, play Christmas carols. Or they can be down at the local clubs playing with a band. You don't have to be. You know, you can be, you can have that at almost at any age within a few years of work. So you, you can get a lot out of it, but you're not going to hit the top echelons unless you train since the time you're a child. It's just the way it is. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, I, yeah, I think that's fair. Because now, now I think in that, in that you have to come to a, uh, a make a decision. What is it that you want to achieve you know do you want to become the painter's painter and then you're competing against other painters at that level or like you said you know or do you just want to <clears throat> i don't want to say it as a hobby but um but do you want to become known with inside your small community or your small you know area as that oh you're the artist person right Absolutely. <clears throat> just like 
I know a guy. I know a guy who's a guitar player. I was mm-hmm. in a garage band with him in high school. He probably won't even remember that, but he's a guitar player. He's not. I, I know a, a few guys who are real rock and roll players. You know, they're famous. But this guy's not. But he works all the time, and he's a guitarist. Guitarist. He knows all the scales, all the modes. He can play in anything in any key. He's an amazing musician. Knows his instrument backwards and forwards. And he plays every kind of gig you can think of. He plays in clubs. He backs jazz, you know, back jazz players. He'll, uh, he plays in supper clubs. He does weddings, you name it. He plays anything. Mm-hmm. He works all the time. Makes a pretty good living. Nobody's ever heard of him. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of Santana. He's not competing with Santana or Clapton or. He's never a hit record. He says he's too ugly to have a hit record. Uh, <laughs> he's, uh, but he's uh, he had a wonderful life playing his music without being famous, without, you know, nobody's heard of him, other than people in, you know, in, in his area of the country where he lives. A lot of people are regional, you know. I'm somewhat yep. regional. You know, I kind of do a regional thing. Uh, I do a lot of national advertising, so people in various parts of the country know who I am. But most of my efforts are spent in, in New England. I'm a New England winner. Yeah. But even outside of that, like just having the work itself carry its own merit, right? without marketing or name or recognition or any of that other stuff. Um, because you have, you know, what is it? Close to 230 years of experience now. Um, I'm playing with you. But you have this depth, this richness of experience, you know? I mean, literally you were, you know, professional before I was even born, which is, which is kind of blows my mind. But shoes older than you are. Yeah, and they have, and the duct tape on them is still older. And, <laughs> still pliable. And and hopefully you'll tell me about the butter in them. But um, but <laughs> the the yeah. So you you have this richness that's in the work, and that's when I was looking at your work. That's what I was feeling. You know, a lot of that. Um, it's very interesting because a lot of people go in into the ateliers and they learn these techniques, and then they come out and they paint and they have these techniques but they don't have um, the, the spirit, that, that richness that your work does. You know, one of my favorite some pieces. Of them, some of them, you know, when, the athlete, when, when I was with Ives, there really weren't any athletes other than Ives and maybe Richard Lack. And uh, people went to the Art Students League in those days. There were some good teachers there. But and then all of a sudden there was an explosion of ateliers, particularly the couple in Italy, but all over. Jacob yeah. Collins in New York. All of a sudden, there were a lot of athletes around. And I was excited. I thought, well, there's going to be this burst of fabulous young painters. Mm-hmm. And for many years, I kept wondering where they all were. I saw these people continue to repeat the exercises they had performed in the studios, painting the same tabletop still lifes, doing yep. the same bedpost style portraits. But, and I thought, well, this isn't much of a payoff for all that work. But recent, in recent years, I've gotten to know some young painters who are very, very good. They're very creative that, that have taken those tools and started to make their own things with them. So I, I'm confident. I know I, all of a sudden in the last couple of years, I know a bunch of them now. So yeah. I think there's a, a beautiful pendulum swing, right? You had that abstract expressionism, you know, going that direction. And then people are like just so sick and tired of being told that they're, Oh, my kids could, you know, you, you heard, Oh, my four year old could do that. And then if you were serious, you're like, I never want anyone to ever look at my work and say a four year old could do it. Right. And so then you go and then, yeah, this big boom of um, this classical training. Um, and I think as the pendulum comes back, there's going to be a blending. And I think the key is... Do you know how much polka you can add to rock and roll before you run it? How much what? Polka? Do you know how much polka you can add to rock and roll before you ruin it? <laughs> or in my case, how much rock and roll you can add to country before you ruin it? Yeah. <laughs> None. You can't add any polka to rock and roll without ruining it. I think the same is true of traditional painting. A traditional, but it's great to be a, a modern artist. It's no, no, fine. no. I'm going to push back on you on that one. It, it's fine with me, but I'm not. I think the traditional painting is its own thing. It's it is, the, but but with yeah. that said, you you spoke about design, and that's where I was going to go with that. Not not in terms of abstraction, but I, I, like Frank for for uh, for Zetti. Um, once said, um, you know, the more and more he paints and he composes, 
he realizes the, these compositions that he's making are just they're, they're abstract paintings even though ultimately what he creates is you know representational but that decision making that that you know the designing that of those is, paintings are that is true in the 1600s as well long before we ever talked about modern painting exactly exactly what was that? Again, I don't really. I don't have anything against modern painting. Just I don't have anything against against polka music. It's just not my thing. <laughs> I feel you. Um, so one of the paintings that I really, really loved uh, that I was uh, when I was going through your website was the rooftop one. Oh, that's an old. That's from like the late, the late eighties, I think. Oh, really? I paint oh. one of those blue pictures every year in November. I've done one a year for since like 78, I think somewhere in there. Hmm. Uh, that's sort of this ongoing thing. I make one of those blue night scenes every year. There's several of them on my website. And if you go on Instagram, I think there's a few more. Oh, very I cool. Page too. I think Stapleton dash Kearns or something like that. Okay. I don't, I loaded a bunch of pictures onto it and don't ever go there and visit it. So I don't know what goes on on Instagram. <laughs> and I post it. If you, if you go to my Facebook page, you can scroll through that. A bunch of, Every once in a while, I've loaded a bunch of paintings up onto that. But uh, I make one of those blue pictures a year. In fact, it's a, I don't know, it's sort of my, my getting ready for Christmas thing every year. They're never overtly Christmas pictures. Only one actually I've read Christmas tree and lights in it. They're, oh, just okay. night scenes. They're just night scenes, usually urban or town night scenes. A lot of them are Rockport or Gloucester. Uh, make one a year. Well, it's funny that you say the Christmas because when I was looking at the, the rooftop one, as my eye would just bounce through the rooftops, right? And then you would almost kind of want to look and peer into each of those homes because the lights were on and then it would fade off. I, I was like, oh my God, I kind of feel like Santa Claus. Like I went to that house and that house and that house and that house and bounced there, you know, as my eye bounced through For the many, painting. Many years, the galleries in Rockport, uh, Rockport's an art colony about 40 miles north of Boston. Uh, and it used to have lots of artists with their own artist-run galleries. Not so much anymore, but it did once. Uh, that's a world that's kind of slipped away, I'm afraid. Mm. But we'd run the galleries up until maybe Christmas. Some people quit at Columbus Day, but usually most people would be open until about Christmas. And then the winter, you'd be closed. It wasn't mm -hmm. by there in the winter. And so doing that blue picture uh, gave me – that last big sale of the year, you know, mm, nice. Christmas under the tree for my family. So, but I always called them blue night scenes. It's the only one is overtly Christmas like. I did paint one that was had Christmas tree lights on it, but they're just blue night scenes. But That's I, cool. I, and everybody in the world has ripped me off for that idea. What? More people imitate those. Oh, yeah. ripped you ripped you off for those ideas? Yeah. I thought you said uh, okay, got you. Yeah. And oddly enough, there was a guy from Pennsylvania who did something similar that I became aware of many years after I started doing it. It was a guy named George Sodder, a hmm. Pennsylvania artist who painted night scenes. Mine are kind of overtly decorative, you know, with the blue and the stars. His were just night scenes. They were more realist than mine, I guess. But So I thought I had an original idea. I sort of did, but George Sodder was there first. I, I, uh... <laughs> Next question. Hey, what's the deal with Miley Cyrus anyway? I don't know, man. <laughs> I guess the better question is, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, um, State, okay. So let's say a young artist walks into your studio because it seems like people can just walk into your studio. And... Uh, and you sit down and you're having a conversation. And uh, what, what advice would you give the, the, the young lad? What does happen routinely, in fact, uh, and I have mentored a lot of people, hmm. uh, some of who are actually professional painters now and some of who, who are not. Uh, I always urge them to get the best training they can lay their hands on. If they, if they can find a way to do it, I, always, I think one of the big ateliers is a great place to start. Uh, I would not go to art school. Mm. If, you, if you want to be an artist, you want to be a teacher, go to art school. But if you want to be an artist to live by your work, I, I suggest one of the ateliers uh, or the Art Students League. My friend Garen Baker is teaching down at the Art Students League. He's, he's a good teacher. Mm. But, In uh, New York? Yeah. And uh, 
but that's about the only thing. It's a formal school that I'd recommend. I don't think they actually give college credit, but uh, I think that uh, Cecil over there in Florence does a good job. Jacob Collins down there in uh, New York does a good job. Uh, Paul Ingbertson above me in Manchester, New Hampshire, I think, I think teaches well. Uh, Tom Dunley is teaching here in, uh, he's one of the suburbs of Boston. They're a bunch of, find a good atelier. They're not all good. You've got to be pick, a bit picky, but uh, I think that's a good place to start if I had a young person who wanted to learn to paint. I don't really, I, I teach the occasional workshop, but I'm not in the business of teaching uh you know, from the ground up, long periods yeah. of time. I'll teach for two days in a row. That's all I want to do. Nice. I've got my art to make, you know. I mean, when you're looking for a good atelier, what, what is it that one should be looking for? Well, I think right off the bat, you ought to, even if you're not, even if you're talking about going to art school, I always I meet people in art schools and they, they say, well, I signed up for Mr. So-and-so's class. And I say, well, or Mrs. So-and-so's class. And I say, oh, did you look at their work? And they say, what? I said, did you look at their work before you signed up for their class? I said, no, I guess I didn't. I said, why would you take a class from somebody in art without checking to see whether they knew what they were doing? Yep. The first thing you want to do is you want to look at the teacher's work. See, I have this theory that no one can teach you to do anything they can't do themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd, I'd say, suggest it's a good to, theory. Suggest to people that they take a look at, at the work of where we're supposed to be teaching them. Uh, and then the second thing is uh, you look at their students. What are they making? You know, you look at a factory, you say, what does it, what do they make there? You look at, you know, an automobile manufacturer and say, well, can they actually make a car? You want to look at teachers and find out if they've ever actually turned out any pros. If you want to look at the art schools, universities, I guess you'd say, do they turn out any teachers? Uh, you want to look at the kind of results an atelier is getting. That's not so easy to do, but you usually can. Uh, but there's there's a handful. There's six or ten around the world. But when I talk about that, we're talking about giving up, you know, you're probably going to leave your home. I moved to Boston to study. I wasn't, I'm not from Boston. I moved to Boston and no one live there. Uh, you know, so it's a big commitment. Yeah. For most people, uh, most people can't do that unless you're young and, and you're willing to, you know, bet the farm, which is what it takes, incidentally. Uh, you got to bet the farm. But for most of us, you can't do that. But most areas, most towns or cities of any size have somebody who's an accomplished painter that's training people. Uh, yeah, so look at the, the, the teacher's work and then look at the work of the students. Yeah, the real working artist who's teaching on the side. That's, the, that's what you want to do. Yeah. You, you know? And you know, in, in, it's cheaper than going to art school by a lot. Yeah, right? <laughs> But 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 the um, the problem is is we've been sold this 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 I'll just say this idea I won't call it the other three letter word but uh, this idea that you have to go off and get this diploma this you know this receipt as some people would call it this and, and without you, you it called, you called me up and set up this podcast mm -hmm. and you want to talk to me and get my advice on painting and hear what my thoughts on painting. Did you bother to ask me whether I had a high school diploma? I'll tell you a secret. I don't. I have no high school diploma, yet I've been a very successful painter. Nobody cares. Exactly. You'll be a teacher. You're a teacher. They care. If you just want to be an artist, nobody cares whether you have a degree from anywhere. It doesn't matter. Yep. Can you do it? <laughs> it's results, it's merit. How do you get the chops? And the same is true in music. Yeah. It's great to have a degree from Berkeley, but if you can play like Jeff Beck, nobody worries about whether you have a degree. Yeah. I know uh, in Norman Rockwell's uh, book, um, he, he wrote this, he wrote about George Bridgman at the Students' Art oh, League. Yeah. And, uh, and he said that he, when he chose the class, I think he flipped a coin. And he ended up getting Bridgman's class versus the other guy's class. And he said, oh, my God, he, he, he was who he Robert was. Beverly Hale? What was that? The other one might have been Robert Beverly, Beverly Hale. No, was, um, Robert Beverly Hale was another student of Bridgman's. Um, this was a, a, another. Yeah. Yeah. And then Michael Bourbon succeeded Hale, I think. I actually went down the league and studied anatomy with Michael Bourbon very briefly. It was good nice. Teacher. Um, 
the uh, book books that are I think are good for painting. Speaking of books, uh, that How I Paint a Picture by Norman Rockwell is a great book. Hmm. But I think the best the best book out there, uh, one of the best books out there, is Harold Speed. Yes, Practice and Science of Drawing. Yep, great book. And if you're a landscape painter, John Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting, great book. Uh, there's also Edgar Payne's book, The Composition of Outdoor Landscape Painting. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, there's a lot of good books. We mentioned Kenyon Cox's book, The Classic Point of View. Uh, there's another good book. Those are, yeah, really good ones. Huh? Well, Mr. Stape, let me ask you one last question before... Uh, we wrap it up here. Um, it's my favorite question. Most important question of the day. The thing I want so badly to be useful to people. Are we missing anything? Forgetting anything? Thing or doing anything stupid? Uh, nothing stupid. But when we're off, we'll be like, oh, man, we could have said that. Eh. Send them to my blog. I remind, I'll remind people. I wrote endless text for you to go read if you want to know more about what I have learned over the years. It's all there and it's free. Just log on to staplecurrents at blogspot.com. And I gave away everything I know. You can just go read it. It didn't cost anything. Beautiful, beautiful. I'll definitely put that in the show notes so people can click on the link and just go right over to it. And, um, and yeah, yeah. So, Stape, quick question. What do you love to eat, man? Favorite thing to eat is a casserole that my mother made. I grew up in Minnesota, and out there they have what they call hot dishes, and mm -hmm. I make it myself. I've never, I've, people in Minnesota might eat it, but nobody here in New England's ever had it. But it's my specialty dish, and it's a wild rice casserole. I make, uh, I get about uh, two cups of wild rice. Wild rice is funny stuff. It's not really rice, you know. It's a grass seed. Great stuff. It's not cheap. And it's not easy to find. Real wild rice. You get about two cups of wild, two cups of real wild rice. Boil it up, throw it in a pan, and then you fry about a pound or two pounds of Jimmy Dean's hot pork sausage. Throw that in there along mm -hmm. with a pound of mushrooms and one of those great big cans of mushroom soup. You mm -hmm. stir it all up and you cook it in the oven. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very good. That's my favorite thing. Is this wild rice casserole that that my mother makes and I make it myself. So <laughs> mushrooms, cream of mushroom, right? The yep. wild the rice, sausage you cook, and it's wild rice. Like cooking, it's like cooking uh, brown rice. It takes a long time to cook. Yeah. You to boil it. You know? Interesting. And, uh, well, there you got the recipe. That's my favorite favorite thing. I might have to go try that tonight, my friend. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Play this, play this podcast back and try it. So you're going to take your wild oh, rice it's, and you're gonna boil a, it up. And you're going to, like two cups, and then you're going to throw in a couple of pounds this, we're making five, seven pounds of food here, right? Wow. And you're going to have a, one of those big aluminum pans you get at the grocery store for cooking turkeys or something. And you uh, put put your two pounds of Jimmy Dean's hot pork sauce. It kind of comes in a, a sort of a tube, a plastic thing from the breakfast section. Mm -hmm. And uh, about a pound of mushrooms. You throw those in there and one of those big, you know, the super-sized cans of mushroom soup. Mm-hmm. Stir it all up, maybe cut up some onions, put them on top, even maybe some of those dirty fried onions you get in a can that you can mm. sprinkle on the top, and then you bake it until it's brown. It's very good. How many people are you feeding with that thing? Small army. <laughs> a small army. That's right. Or you can put it in your refrigerator. If you're starving, I should put it in your refrigerator and live on it for a week. There's a solution. There it is. Um, man, that sounds so good. Uh, okay. And so uh, you did mention um, in the in the watch call that there's a restaurant down the street that you like to frequent. Yeah, there's a restaurant down the street, the Dairy Restaurant, and mm -hmm. they make really good Reuben down there. Now mm -hmm. they don't make it on a rye; they make it on a marble rye, so that's a point off. It should really be on pumpernickel, in fact. But they make a pretty good Reuben. I like a Reuben sandwich. You know, I've got fat living on me. I'm sort of a kind of sort of food anyway. You got fat living on you. <laughs> that's funny um real quick man uh tell me about this uh this butter in the shoe thing oh oftentimes i get students in classes and they'll ask me for how do you how do you paint water how do you paint snow and the real answer of course is something like well you know you, uh it's opalescent and you spend 20 years fooling with it until you get it but they want a quick answer you know and so i always say oh you have to put butter in your shoes 
<laughs> I'll let him stare at me for a while, looking kind of quizzical. What? What do you mean butter in your shoes? I, I give it just the right amount of time, like 60, 60, 40 seconds. And I'll say, when they're looking at me quizzically, then I'll say, it makes of your entire body a giant electromagnet. Uh, in other words, you know, there is no answer. It makes no you connect to the, to the scene better. Uh, so there is, it's, it's how I answer questions for which there is no simple answer. That's brilliant. I'll tell you a funny story. I did a podcast once, and um, it, was, it started at a certain time, and I had maybe about 30 minutes, 20 minutes or something before the podcast. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I haven't eaten. So I ran out, and we had a refrigerator uh out in the uh, in the garage, right, as well as the kitchen. So some of the stuff was in the garage. So I went out there and I grabbed this thing of butter and some stuff, and I put it in my pocket because I was carrying this stuff. I think it was eggs or something. And and, uh, and for some stupid reason, I totally forgot I put the butter in my pocket, right? And yeah. so I'm, I'm in the middle of this podcast, and I'm like, you know, the person's talking, and I put my hand in my pocket. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Like, okay, I feel, maybe I can paint water in snow now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Steve, it was awesome uh, talking with you, man. This was, if I uh, could get the, get the closing word in here, I suppose yes, I'm please. speaking to people who want to learn to paint. I might add that anybody can learn to paint. It's not a special skill. That doesn't mean that you're going to be, uh, you know, a famous, great, world-renowned painter. But anybody can learn to paint well. If you'll just do a few things, you have to, Apply yourself, find a good teacher, and work hard. You need to go to the museums. You need to read the books. There's classic texts on painting. And you need to go to museums and look at great art. You do those things. You consistently work at it. You can be a fine painter. Anybody can do it. There you have it.